So while we are waiting for more people to join, so I'll just kick off with an introduction. So welcome to Bao Protocol Roundtable webinar. So I'm Cherry, your moderator today. I've got my colleagues here with me, Nia Vash, Pamitayo, and Nacho. So we are thrilled to have every one of you to join us today as we embark on this exciting virtual journey of knowledge sharing in imaging techniques. So this webinar is one hour long with 55 zero minutes of presentation and 10 minutes of Q&A. It's our great honor to have Dr. Vic Meadows with us today. She's a highly accomplished um, researcher with an impressive academic background. Dr. Meadows completed her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology at Indiana University School of Medicine last year. She's currently serving as a rigorous IRACDA inspired postdoctoral fellow, Scala postdoctoral scholar, and mistletoe research fellow at Rutgers University. One aspect of Dr. Meadows' research that she particularly enjoys is histology. Whether you are tuning in, from across the globe or from the comfort at your own home. Let's dive into Dr. Meadows' world of imaging. Please welcome Dr. Meadows. Thank you, Cherry, for that lovely introduction. Um, if you will give me a few seconds, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully we'll be able to see my presentation. Um, All right, so hopefully it's in presenter mode now and you guys can see yeah. my title slide. Great, okay. So I decided to title today's talk, um, More Than a Pretty Picture, uh, Histology and Quantification, because when we think of histology, or at least when I do, I think of these beautiful colors and images that show us the tissue structure inside our organs. And as uh, Cherry mentioned, I'm an ARACTA fellow here at Rutgers, and this is a wonderful training program for scientists that want to go into teaching and professorship, either at primarily undergraduate institutions or at R1 universities. So I thought I'd give a little plug for that. Today's uh, talk will cover histology, uh, protocol outlines for two very common immunostains, how you can quantify these stains through free software or through lab purchase or institutional purchase software. Um, we'll cover some troubleshooting and we will review together and address whatever questions that y'all may have. Um, some disclaimers are that I made most of these schematics with BioRender and if you have access to BioRender, I highly recommend it for image generation. And a lot of the images that you'll see today were either pulled from my PhD studies in the Francis lab, um, public websites like Twitter or other social media websites or through licensed free stock images. Um, and today I, since I'm trying to be a better teacher, I'm gonna to try to have an interactive webinar. So if y'all don't mind either going to the website link here in the bottom right, or scanning that QR code so that you can join the poll EV um, sort of interactive platform that I've created for y'all. And I'm keeping an eye on the um, audience ship here. So if you guys have connected, just give me a little thumbs up. And once I see a majority of the thumbs up reaction, I can move on from this slide. Okay, well, it looks like um, we're doing great. So I will go ahead and move on. Um, so my first order of business is, what do you think of when you read or hear the word histology? And I wanna sort of gauge where the audience is at with this. So we have H and E, and that is a very common, um, it's considered a simple stain, but if you've done H and E, you can always have issues with it. Um, okay, PAS staining and dead. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Definitely tissue, a lot of tissue. Awesome. So we are all sort of thinking of the same thing is how can this be applied to our research? Because if we're trying to understand molecular um, that, the goings on in our cells, we're going to have to sort of look at a bigger picture and hone it. 
thank you guys so much for interacting with that. So histology comes from the words histos, which means tissues, and logos, which is the study. So it's the study of the microscopic structures of our tissues. So um, tissue or the word tissues was coined by um, Dr. Xavier Bichat because he, before then, they didn't really have a word in the medical lexicon that could define how uh, multicellular and dynamic our organs really are. So he's often considered to be the father of histology. Um, and histology or pathology is a branch of science that really focuses on examining tissues, not just to get a macroscopic view, but to understand the intricate network within them. So in histology or in pathology, there are four broad categories of tissues within our organs, including epithelial tissue, connective tissue, which includes the extracellular matrix, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. Um, in all of these organs or tissue types have very different um, molecular makeups. So staining them is going to be unique to each tissue type that you're targeting. So your fixation methods, staining methods, or applications of different stains will change depending on your tissue type. So it's important to remember that you can troubleshoot by going back and thinking, okay, what is the broad category of the tissue I'm staining for? And then you can sort of move on from there. And you guys are all attending this talk and I'm hoping that I'll be able to introduce some new histology resources or expose you to new cool experiments that you can try in your lab. But there's a lot of resources online that's available to everybody. So BioProtocol, which you're attending their webinar now, has a lot of open access protocols that can help you with your research. But also on YouTube, there's a ton of videos. Like I just searched IHC protocol, as you can see in the top right, and there was a ton of videos about showing people how they section tissues, how they stain tissues. Um, as you can see here in the top right, they're actually going through the protocol step by step and showing you what you need to do. So when you apply it in your lab, not only have you read the protocol, you now have visualized it. So it helps with the learning and it makes it more accessible for more scientists. And I will also say, since I'm pretty active on Twitter, that social media is a great way to get information and to get access to histology. So there's a few hashtags, but the most um, popular ones are Microscopy Monday and Fluorescence Friday or Fluorescence Friday. And this is when scientists that perform a lot of immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence will post their beautiful images online. But as you can see in the image in the center, scientists can also ask the science Twitter network, what am I seeing in my histology right now? And that can help you better your science and how you apply different stains to your research. So I guess in summary, don't be afraid to reach out to scientists if they're doing something really cool that you're interested in. Some general principles for histology protocols include tissue processing, which means that you're going to fix the tissue state from its live to sort of uh, freezing it in time as best you can so that you can understand what is going on in that specific tissue. And the goal of the first two bullet points are to harden the tissue and, as I mentioned, to preserve the details that you stopped at that moment. Deceration is mostly um, accounted for wax embedded or formalin fixed in wax embedded agents. Um, this is when you remove the embedding agent from the tissue itself because these will mask what you're trying to stain for. And so this is an important step, but it doesn't apply to all histology. But since it applies to most, I figured I'd include it in the general principles. Staining is where you're going to visualize the different structures or detect target molecules. So if you use a simple stain like HNE, which I will cover shortly, you're going to visualize sort of morphological details of your tissue, but you're not necessarily detecting a target molecule. 
Whereas if you use immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry, you are trying to detect a target molecule within the morphological details of your tissue. And then mounting is an overlooked but very important part of histology. You need to preserve the stain integrity and structure of the sample because the likelihood of you just tossing your slide and never looking at it again is quite low. Um, you may need to revisit your slide to see if the stain is consistent with further stains. Now that we have more of a, a computer age approach to science, we tend to scan and have really high resolution scans of our stains, which makes this better. But sometimes when you communicate or collaborate with scientists that have had a lab for many, many years, they will still have their tissue slides and you're still going to be able to look at them and see what stains they performed. So for simple stains, um, we're trying to see how diseases, injuries, and other pathologies begin. They usually begin in the molecular or atomic level, but that's quite expensive to explore and it's hard to deduce in a whole organism. So we tend to focus in the cell and tissue level and we use our findings from this to make diagnoses and inform treatments for either um, future applications in translational science or in veterinary science. And currently the most affordable diagnosis for this sort of disease development is histology. Staining is um, used to highlight different important features of your tissue, as I mentioned earlier as well as to enhance the tissue contrast. And this is dependent on the atomic and molecular levels within these cells. In fact, most basic dyes, um, not basic as the, the pH, but simple stains, I guess, um, are dependent on the charges of the molecules. So with basophilic dyes, these are basic dyes and they bind to acidic molecules. Whereas eosinophilic staining um, is used with an acidic dye that binds to basic uh, molecules within your cells. So it's important to understand what you're staining for. If you're trying to look at nuclear detail, then you're going to want to use a basic dye like hematoxylin. But if you're trying to target more of a cytoplasmic feature, you're going to want to use an acidic dye. Um, I have a bunch of these QR codes sprinkled throughout my talk. Um, this is being recorded and it will be posted. So don't worry, you will have access to it later. But most of them, I have them labeled with what they will be able to provide you if you scan them and visit the website. So for this one, this is a textbook that's online by the NIH where they talk about the molecular compositions of cells. And this is really important to read if you're trying to assess what is the best stain I can use when I'm studying my tissues. So for hematoxylin and ESN or HNE, it's a combination of two dyes. Hematoxylin is basic and it binds the DNA um, and sort of colors DNA content. And this changes dependent on time and um, on the type of hematoxylin because they have a uh, different, um, what is the word? Uh, they add different uh, compounds to it like aluminum or nickel to change the color and progressive or regressive properties of hematoxylin. Oh, it's called mordant. I have it right here on the slide. <laughs> so progressive stains, means that you're going to stain, it's usually a very diluted hematoxylin and you're gonna stain for your um, nuclear material slowly and then stop it right when you reach the end point you want. For regressive stains, you're going to overstain it. So it's a very concentrated hematoxylin. And then you're going to use an acid to sort of differentiate and de-stain some of the hematoxylin from your nuclear content. For ESN, um, this is the acidic dye and it binds cytoplasmic components and connective tissue. And when they add fluoxine and acetic acid, it can sharpen the color. So here on the left, we can see these red blood cells are sort of this really bright magenta pink and the slightest cytoplasmic features are more of a 
lighter gradient shades of pink. Um, here in the bottom, I provided some best staining practices and histological staining methods from various resources that are all free and that y'all can use. Um, but just to go back to review this slide, hematoxylin, which is a basic dye, will bind DNA and sort of give it shades of lavender and purple, sometimes black if they have addition, uh, an additional metal to the hematoxylin dye. And with ESN, it's an acidic dye that binds the cytoplasmic components and connective tissue like collagen. And you can sharpen the color with an addition of fluoxine or an acetic acid. So for our next poll, what type of dye results in eosinophilic staining? And I know this feels a little bit like school, so I apologize to y'all. All right, so it looks like we're about 50-50. Um, oh, no, okay, acidic dye is making a comeback. All right, so it, the answer is actually eosinophilic. Uh, staining results from acidic dyes. So that would be something like eosin. Awesome, thank you guys so much for participating. Um, so the next part of this talk will actually get sort of to the the bulk of protocols and troubleshooting and things to consider whenever you move into the field of histology or pathology. So one of the first things you're gonna to have to do in tissue processing is fix your tissue. And this is when you're sort of freezing it in time, arresting the cell from having any autolysis or degenerative processes. Um, one of, so there's four QR codes, there's a ton of, resources online, but I sort of narrowed it down to common fixatives that are used both in immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence. But um, most of these, except for the alcohols, work by cross-linking the proteins so that they sort of get arrested in state. And the most common ones are paraformaldehyde or PFA or neutral buffered formalin. And um, this is mostly for like whole tissue mounts or tissue sections that were frozen, and then you cut them and put them on a slide. Um, one of the, and we'll move into some advantages and disadvantages shortly, but one of the things to consider when selecting a fixative is to understand what the protein or molecule you're staining for does or is, um, because you could have something that gets precipitated out and then you can't find it in your stain and it's a false negative if you use alcohols. So for these fixatives, um, there's most people will use a formaldehyde type or methanol or ethanol for fixation. And as you can see in the advantages, there's an ideal situation for all of these different types of fixatives. So formaldehyde, like I mentioned earlier, is one of the most common ones. This is the formalin or the PFA, and it's great for morphology preservation, but some antibodies um, can't detect the antigens because formalin or formaldehyde will actually mask the protein epitopes. So it's making it makes it really hard to sort of identify if you have that protein or molecule in your sample. It's also a toxic compound and you have to handle it under the hood, which makes it um, sort of, it gives this, it just makes it difficult because you have to make sure that you have your setup in a safe place so that you can also be healthy and continue with your life. Um, with alcohols, um, they permeabilize your samples. So if it's not required to permeabilize your samples, Maybe that's like not the ideal fixative, um, but um, since alcohols can't arrest proteins where they are and it sort of precipitates them, if you're looking for a specific epitope, they're gonna be difficult to find. And with buoyans, which is a, a common fixative for collagen staining or fibrotic staining methods, it's ideal for soft to delicate structures, but it contains a compound or um, 
acid called picric acid, which is explosive, and it has to be handled very carefully. So um, another downside to buoyance is that it can't be used with in situ hybridization, which is a common staining technique now that we're getting sort of into this more omics pathology era. Um, so that is something that to consider whenever you're moving on to histology. So um, I'm going to talk about two main tissue processing methods. And the first one is formalin fixed to paraffin embedded tissue, which is often um, denoted by the acronym FFPE. And this is when you fix your tissue in usually neutral, but for formalin for a series of hours, and then you wash it with some ethanol or water. And it's recommended to wash this excess fixative because formalin can actually affect your staining downstream if it's overfixed. And then your samples will move to a tissue processor. And this could sort of be like a dip and dunk system. So it's an arm that sort of like puts your tissues down into a well filled with this reagent, and then it lifts it up and puts it in the next reagent, or it'll be like a sink. And this is more of an enclosed system shown in this slide. And it's this sink will fill and drain all the reagents you need for your tissue processing. And since paraffin wax is hydrophobic, um, your tissue will have to undergo a lot of dehydrating steps. So it'll go through different buffers of increasing ethanol concentration, and then it'll end in xylene and then get um, sort of encased in wax, as can be seen here in the bottom right. So xylenes, xylenes will remove the ethanol and dissolve fats. So processing adipose tissue is actually quite difficult in this system, but it's, the system is generally well liked because the wax will infiltrate all the parts of your tissue and you can have these blocks that you can keep for years and years to sort of analyze. So the next step after you have these blocks made is to cut them. And to do that, you're going to use a machine called a microtome. These microtomes as pictured here on the left have a very sharp blade and a crank handle on the right where you can sort of move your tissue up and down in front of the blade to get these thin ribbons of tissue sections. The thickness of your sections will affect your stain intensity and antibody specificity. So most commonly, um, these tissue samples will be cut at four to six micron thickness. But if you have, um, maybe you're staining for a specific molecule that requires higher thickness, you can go as high as 10 microns thickness. So before we can move on to our exciting staining, we have to uh, do our antigen retrieval. And this is because formalin masks our epitope. And the epitope is sort of the, the chemical puzzle piece that your protein has that your antibody is gonna bind to. So to reverse epitope masking, there are two main methods, the heat-induced epitope retrieval, or the H-I-E-R, or the enzymatic retrieval. And I've had most experience with the heat-induced epitope retrieval. Um, and this is one that's most commonly applied through most vendors that create antibodies. So I will focus mostly on this one. So there are four main heating sources that you can use when you do this epitope retrieval or um, antigen retrieval. And they all focus on heating the sample enough that your protein denatures and then renatures back to the state it needs to be for your antibody detection. Um, the microwave method is the one that I used in the Francis lab, and it is super fast. It, you can get it boiled within three to four minutes. But the downside is you can have an uneven distribution of heat in your sample, um, which affects your staining. Um, you can have buffer evaporation that had happened to me a few times and that's devastating because now you can't move forward with that slide. So you have to be very careful whenever you're using the microwave method, but it is very inexpensive and accessible. Um, a recent method that I've been exposed to is the vegetable steamer. It's really easy to use. 
the heat is distributed evenly because you preheat your buffer in the vegetable steamer before you add your slides and then you add your slides and leave it in there to incubate a little bit longer. The only downside is how long it takes. <laughs> it takes a good 40 minutes to sort of retrieve your antigen when you use the vegetable streamer um, method. The water bath um, tends to be even longer, but it has the same benefits as the vegetable steamer. And the pressure cooker method, I've never had experience with, but the downsides seem to be that it can be quite expensive. And since the tissue sort of gets heated, but not allowed to boil, there are some artifacts that result in your tissues themselves. Uh, another component of antigen retrieval is the buffer you're using. So a lot of people will talk about citrate buffers or TRIS-CDTA buffers, but what really matters for your antibody and for your future staining is the pH. So you want to have the correct pH for the antibody you're looking for. Um, if you have a very acidic buffer, which is like glycine HCL, um, you can have great immunoreactivity, but it may not detect all the antigens you're looking for. Um, the most common one is citric acid or citrate buffers, which tend to range from six, a pH of six to seven. Um, however, some antibodies prefer a more basic solution. So the high pH one is usually a TRIS, EDTA together or separate buffer. Um, and this is ideal for overfixed or hard to detect antigens. So like maybe lowly expressed proteins. But the downside is, is that EDTA can distort morphology of your tissues. So that's something to consider when you're moving forward um, with your antigen retrieval steps. Another way to sort of get your tissues um, set up and on a slide is to use frozen tissue or um, through uh, frozen cells on a slide smear. So what you'll, if it's tissue, you'll collect your fresh tissue and embed it in optimal cutting temperature media or OCT and freeze it as shown here on the bottom right or here in the center, uh, I guess center left. Um, and then you section it in a frozen temperature using the cryotome. And this is sort of a frozen microtome. It's very, very cold. Anybody that has had experience with this knows that you need to take your hands out every once in a while and kind of warm them up because it's at negative 20 to preserve the tissue. So it that can be a little bit problematic and sort of a technical hurdle to get over if you're the one cutting these sections. But otherwise, it has the same features as a microtome where thickness will depend on the stain or antibody you're going to use for the tissue itself. But before we can move on to staining for these frozen tissues, we need to fix them. So for FFPE, they are formal and fixed before you even cut the sections. But for these frozen embedded tissues, you're going to cut the sections and then fix them. But uh, the main thing to remember with histology is that you're going to have to fix your tissue and cut it before you start your staining. And the order may change depending if it's frozen or formally fixed. So to start talking about some immunostains, um, one of the, I, I guess one of my favorite ones is immunohistochemistry or IHC. And this happens, it's like a chemical reaction on your slide, which is really cool. Um, what you're going to have is a, a substrate, a chromogen gets used and um, an enzymatic reaction occurs to deposit this coloration stain. And you can do multi-targeted staining as shown by here by Dr. Kennedy at um, IUSM, where she stained bile ducts pink and B cells brown. So you can have multi-target staining with IHC, but it is quite limited. I think the maximum that I have seen is three. Um, so that is one of the limitations of immunohistochemistry. A great thing about IHC is that there are commercially available kits that have technical support and lots of protocols online, which makes it really nice if you're trying to troubleshoot. And this is visualized with a bright field microscope, which although they are expensive, is more commonly available than confocal microscopes, which are the ones required for immunofluorescence. And so just a brief um, overview over the IHC protocol, you're going to have an antigen on your tissue that you detect with a primary antibody. 
And if you have indirect IHC, you will have a secondary antibody that's bound to the HRP polymer. And you will add your substrate, which then creates this brown precipitate. If you have direct IHC, this HRP polymer is directly tied to your primary antibody. This is the latter, the direct IHC is usually very expensive and it's not quite common uh, because if your primary antibody specificity is quite low, you could have um, false positive staining and high background, which is not ideal. So this indirect method of having a secondary antibody that contains the reporter is the most common way that IHC is performed. Um, and there are various types of IHC that are indirect. You can have biotinylated secondary antibodies that you then bind to streptavidin that contains the HRP, but all of them result from chromogen substrate conversion by an enzyme. So it's like a miniature chemical reaction on a slide. Um, and positive staining or quantification of this type of staining can be done through semi-quantification, which is where you calculate the positive area over the whole field. And although this isn't quite as um, specific because you're not finding the total amount of that protein in your whole uh, tissue, you are sort of looking at the presence of this in the morphological situation that is your tissue that you're staining. So it is, um, it does help provide you some insight as to what's going on in your system. So for immunofluorescence or IF, which is also very stunning, you have fluorescence detection of a fluorophore that is excited and then visualized using spectral wavelengths, which is a fluorescence or confocal microscope. So IHC uses the chromogen, yeah. And then the IF uses a fluorophore. As you can see here, um, IF can actually support like five or more staining um, sort of excitations due to the different fluor, uh, fluorophores you can buy. So as long as your spectral excitation and emissions don't overlap, you can have a bunch of different markers on your tissue here, as shown with Dr. Enjevich from MUSC. So as to go over the protocol for immunofluorescence, you have your antigen and for indirect, you'll have a primary and secondary antibody that contains a fluorophore. Light will be emitted onto this fluorophore and the fluorescence will be measured. As you can see in the bottom uh, um, sort of schematic made on bio render. Negative stains will have some sort of like fluorescent feature and it's not due to like positive staining because the positive staining as shown on the left will actually emit light. But um, this is important to remember when you do quantify your immunofluorescence because um, with immunohistochemistry, you're sort of looking at the area that's positive over total area but with immunofluorescence, you need to look at light intensity as well as area because you have a specific uh, basal level of fluorescence in your tissue that you're working with. Um, for nuclear staining, which is really cool about immunofluorescence is that you don't use an antibody for this. They just use fluorescent molecules like DAPI or HOSH. So that helps uh, sort of prevent you from having to use an antibody for your nuclear stain. And then you sort of limit all the targets you can have. Um, an important note for immunofluorescence as well, and I'll go over this in a little bit, is that you wanna have sort of a higher resolution image when you're quantifying because um, discriminating intensity when it's a lower resolution can be quite difficult. So an overview of our general workflow, um, you're going to have to prepare your tissue. And if you're doing immunohistochemistry, you'll have to sort of do your antigen or epitope retrieval. If you're using immunofluorescence, you just need to fix your tissue and make sure that it's ready to go. From then, you're going to block with a serum um, or a BSA. You'll incubate with your primary antibody. You'll detect it with your secondary antibody. And from there, you can counter stain in immunohistochemistry with hematoxylin, which stains the nuclear um, content, and you can visualize with a bright field microscope. 
Whereas with immunofluorescence, you stain with nuclear staining of Daffy or Koch, and then visualize with the fluorescence or confocal microscope. So back to our poly B. So I'll give you guys a second to get back to that. Which immunostain uses chromogen as the detection method? And for this one, click on the image that you think is correct. And we should be able to see all of your little clicks. All right, yeah, so I'm seeing them starting to build here on the left side. That's right. So IHC uses chromogen and immunofluorescence uses a fluorophore. Good job, y'all. You guys are ready to do histology. All right, so now to the nitty gritty, we're going to talk about image analysis and semi-quantification. So ideal, in an ideal situation, you have these beautiful histology stains that have very light backgrounds with really dark uh, positive staining areas and your standard error or standard deviation bar is this small and it's perfect. However, we all know that that's not the case in science. Sometimes you have high backgrounds, sometimes you have a tissue morphology that gets lost due to like processing or handling methods. But it's, it's just important to remember that when you quantify your histology, you're just doing an approximate measurement of data. You're not having a absolute being measured. This is very similar to Western blot. When you extract protein from a piece of tissue, that's not representative of the entire tissue because it's a piece of that tissue. So you're sort of just getting an overview um, data point for your study. Image J and Photoshop are free or at least affordable applications for data analysis. And through my research for this presentation, Image J seems to have a lot of different features that I didn't know about. So thank you guys for helping me learn about that. Um, that can help you with your data analysis. And one of the best things about quantifying histology, which I know not a lot of people quantify their histology, but a benefit it is that you can interpret your findings because you're taking more than one representative image and you're grouping them by treatment so that you can understand what's going on in your study. All right, so I'm going to talk about ImageJ first. It's an image processing program that was developed at the NIH. It's a tool for image analysis, and they have this for both Windows and Mac operating systems. You can download ImageJ with a QR code in the bottom left, but also if you just search for it, it is commonly used and it's not a, it's not a scam. <laughs> but when you use ImageJ, your computer screen will look much like mine did here in the, in the right. You're going to have your, your ImageJ program bar here. And you're going to open an image by clicking File, Open, and Upload Your Image. This was after I had already started processing it, so yours won't look like that. It'll look more like the original histology. But to process or start the semi-quantification process, one of the things that they recommend to do is to convert your image to 8-bit. And I provided the instructions on how to do that here. And this will turn your image into a grayscale. And from there, you can select the positive staining by selecting for the dark staining that would have been positive in the color system. And you toggle um, these two parameters in the threshold uh, part of the application or software to select the positive staining. Because if you made this part, let's say 200, it would start selecting for the nuclear material because that is also darker than the cytoplasm. From there, you need to set what measurements you want. I always select for area and area fraction, which will give you the percent area. And then you can measure. And here in the bottom right, I show the area and the percent area of this one image that I processed using image J. Um, you can use image J for immunofluorescence as well. And there's a really great program called Fiji and you can access it or read about it here. Um, there's a lot of uh, method papers that have been written and published on using these softwares for your histology analysis. So definitely take advantage of these different sort of image toolboxes for peer reviewed papers so that you can assess which program is best for your needs or for your study goals. 
Um, the next program you can use is Photoshop. Um, although I have found that most people tend to use ImageJ, I think Photoshop is more of a user-friendly version and um, it helps you select for color rather than like the darkness or intensity of your stain. So in Photoshop, you will open an image, much like I did here in the top right, and you will um, select measurement log so that you can get this log of positive staining in the bottom of your window. And you can select your positive staining by using the wand, the magic wand tool. And with once you click on that, I show it here in the sort of center, um, once you click on that, you're going to select the brown staining for this one because this was an IHC that used DAB as a substrate. And it'll highlight the darkest bits. But if you increase the tolerance, you can sort of highlight the lighter brown, but still not get any of the non-positive staining. So that is how you adjust your selection is by using the magic wand tool to select your positive staining and adjusting the tolerance. From this, you can calculate your percent area by um, dividing the positive total area or positive area from the total area of your image. So some tips for anybody that wants to use Photoshop for quantifying their images. Start with a positive control or a sample that you see has the darkest stain and keep that same tolerance for all the images that you process because what you want to do is be consistent through your analysis methods. Um, one of the biggest downfalls is if you start changing parameters and that sort of increases the bias in your research. So you wanna make sure that you keep it consistent. Um, if you zoom in to 100 to 200%, you can actually visualize individual pixels on Photoshop and that can help you select positive staining as well. And if you zoom out to 50%, um, of the view, you can actually see um, if you've selected any sort of non-positive staining. So it's a great way to sort of check to check yourself by zooming in to make sure you're checking positive only and zooming out to verify it's only positive. And one of the programs that I learned about last night, <laughs> which I wish I had known about during my PhD, is called QPath. This is an open source software for image analysis. It has model learning as part of it. All of the code is supported on GitHub. And I do like from from looking at it and watching some videos, I do think you need some coding experience to benefit from the software. But this is like mad cool. You can actually measure positive area like I showed you with Photoshop and ImageJ, but you can also train a code to do that for the subsequent images. Like imagine expediting your PhD like that. Oh, I would die. So um, the next softwares that I'll briefly touch on are um, very expensive, <laughs> but they're very useful if you have a lab that does a lot of pathology. So the Francis lab uses the Image Pro system, but there's also Visio Farm and Halo from Indica Labs. These all have that model learning or AI options for image analysis, and they have technical support, which can be really, really important when you're trying to sort of figure out what's going on with your histology process. And it's a standardized software application, meaning that every lab that has this program will have the same software. So it's sort of more, um, I, I guess, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? If every lab is using the same system, then it'll be more continuous across our research studies instead of individualized and biased software. So um, these are definitely options that you can look into if your lab is interested in it. But as I mentioned, they are quite expensive. All right, so now sort of in the last few minutes of this talk, um, I'm gonna talk about troubleshooting and some resources. So first with H&E, which is that simple stain that I talked about a long time ago. Um, if you have some dark spots that are not nuclear material, these could be artifacts from the fixation. And so you need to review how you're processing your tissues. Um, and if you lose tissue morphology, um, or if you have uneven staining like here, it could be to under fixation of tissue, meaning that your tissue did not sit in the fixative long enough and it's starting to have autolysis. 
um, or it could mean that there's still wax in the tissue and that's preventing the stain from coming through. Here, I provided some resources for general h &E troubleshooting and a video of this pathologist at a veterinary school going through the different type of h and &E, um, sort of artifacts and improper stainings that you can encounter when you're doing h and &E yourself, which was a great resource. I thought that was really cool. For the immunostains like immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence, there are various things you can fix if you have high background. So with high background in general, you want to reduce your fixation time. Unfortunately, this isn't always an accessible method because that would mean starting over with tissue collection, um, which isn't something that we can always do. So you can increase your blocking time and verify that your retrieval buffer is the correct one for that antibody. Or you can make sure that your tissue is always hydrated throughout your histology staining uh, uh, protocol. Um, if you have high signal with high background in immunofluorescence, this is likely due to overfixation or improper wax removal, or because your fluorochromes are, um, are overlapping. And so instead of having a beautiful green peak and a beautiful red peak, you sort of have this like yellow because both are emitting at the same time. Um, for uh, other sort of issues that you can encounter, if you have a heavy edge staining with no positive staining in the center, this is also due to under fixation. So this means that you're going to have to fix your sample uh, longer or because the tissue has dried out during the staining process and sort of ruined the epitopes that you're looking for. If you have low signal, it could be that it, your fluorochrome is not being excited and the emission isn't being captured. So you have to make sure that you have the right channel for your fluorochrome to um, have emission that you can read. And if you have uneven staining, um, for especially for immunofluorescence and immunohistochemistry, you can add a strip of parafilm and make sure that your samples are in a very humidified incubation. So if you have um, parafilm, you're going to just sort of spread your antibody all over the tissue and it helps incubate it and keep it um, more humidified for the staining process. Um, for immunofluorescent um, confocal imagers, you want to make sure that your stage doesn't have any bends or debris in it. That is sort of making the slide go like this, meaning that your stain is uneven because the slide's uneven. And you want to make sure that you clean all your slides really well before you sort of capture um, your images because you can have artifacts or blurring or improper excitation and emission readings if you don't have clean slides. All right, and with that, I am done with today's talk and I would love to see if I can help you guys um, with any questions that you may have or, um, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, hopefully. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Meadows, for the very informative and interactive webinar on histology. So here's the Q&A session. You're welcome to drop your message in the chat box or simply turn on your mic and ask. So while we are waiting for questions, like I've got a naive question. So my lab runs a lot of flow cytometry. So can we actually use the flow cytometry antibody for IF? So sometimes you can. Uh, some, some antibodies can be used for multiple, uh, multiple applications. Um, I have used a flow antibody for IHC and it did work, which was really cool, but that is not always the case. I would just check the manufacturer um, applications first or just test it out on a couple of slides that you think will have this target in it um, before you move forward with using all of your, all of your slides, um, but sometimes they can. Yeah, so just have to try in that case. on the yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I have a question. Have you used, um, I think there was one software you, sh you showed like that you can train it to do your image analysis. Have you used this for any of your works before? So that, I assume you're talking about QPath, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I have not. I just learned about it last night and I was really upset because I wish I had heard about it before. It would have made my life so much easier a few years back. Um, I have not used it, but they have a lot of videos for that sort of machine learning or um, sort of AI image analysis on their platform. So you can go to their website and watch those and sort of, and they have tutorials where they have images that you like sort of analyze with them. So they, they are very sort of user friendly. So I think that you could explore that a little further. I just, I have never used it. I wish I had. So. Just want to ask Pete because um, I work with plant tissues more than with my own account uh, of tissues. But uh, I feel there are very common problems like how much bias is the image analysis system. I think this is a very critical point for all the people that are using images. Uh, even my students, they use it to calculate um, so simple things like the shoot length or the leaf area. How uh, do you use to solve this kind of problem, especially in the microscopy place? Kind of difficult to, to show if it is a relevant result or if it is just by us, by a section, which kind of challenges you have to face to demonstrate this kind of thing so that you can support better your result? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, so to sort of troubleshoot the, is this like one section bias? Um, one thing you can do is serial sectioning, and I'm not sure how plants are processed in a research laboratory, but that's super cool. I it's way similar. To be honest, it's way similar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so then um, serial sectioning is a great way to sort of confirm stainings, especially if it's something novel or something that maybe you're like going against the dogma. They're saying like, oh, plants never express this protein, and then you found that protein. If you do serial stainings and continue to see that through the serial, but not serial staining, serial sectioning, and you continue to see that through the sections, then that's a way to confirm it. Um, another way is to sort of borrow a different system and stain it on there and see, is that antibody working or not? Usually you're going to want to use at least once with your samples, a negative control, which is where you use the secondary antibody only to see if that's having nonspecific binding. But you can usually tell because you're, you're going to have high background. You're going to have um, inconsistent binding through different sections if it's nonspecific. So I, I think that the serial sectioning would be the way that I would tackle that problem and also mm -hmm. trying to find a system that is that can serve as a positive control that's not that specific plant. Maybe a different plant. Maybe someone works on a mouse organ that also expresses that, and you can like same for that. That's how I would try to tackle it. Yeah, the story can even be more complicated because my my main is not only plant is plant microbes interaction. So <laughs> I don't know if you figure it out how complex it could be, and sometimes it's kind of hard. I, I think it's a good approach is to to have different techniques that support mm -hmm. similar result but less similar. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the quantification is always very precise. Like, uh, okay, if you take the good section, it's gonna be highly different, or the quantification mm -hmm. is gonna be quite different. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I think yeah, it's a good solution what you propose. But I, I think I still have the feeling that for reviewers, it's kind of complicated to. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I see. You. Okay. Um. So, for something that like least for biomedical, you want to have a multiple n <laughs> like so when you do serial sections of one n that's not going to be sufficient for quantification because that mm -hmm. is inherently false right so you're going to want to have to increase your n but you're right you want to make sure you can confirm it with different methods so you could try to do the pcr route but that's not always going to correlate with protein you could try doing western blot but that's sort of like the same thing yeah. but different you know so it's like uh, that is that is a difficult problem yeah i guess the solidity is uh, is scared by different approaches mm -hmm. uh, i, I yeah. used to like to to show them that not only with a, an image approach but several different images approaches is still the same result so it's more consistent but yeah yeah images are always no, this double double edge situation right it's like what the people really want to see <laughs> And the 
people can buy us the best and especially with, uh, i don't know if you you know this uh, it's very classical stuff in twitter now that's uh, people doing forensic forensic uh, approach on images just to detect oh, copies double yeah. copies and so on so everybody want to see images and it's the most uh, mm -hmm. relevant thing sometimes in your figure pad but yeah it's also very easy to treat so it uh, is yeah no but i think with that. those it, yeah, but with those like um, those software that detect that, I think it is becoming harder to trick, mm -hmm. I guess. Like, so hopefully that'll help move like pathology forward. Like I know AI training has been also a sort of controversial issue yeah. because there are a lot of things that the human eye maybe like will detect that a computer cannot recognize or they'll recognize something that it isn't what it is. It's an artifact due to the tissue processing or antibody overstaining or something. Um, so I know that though there there I feel like with every technology or every technique we're going to have controversies and you're going to have to confirm we're not in the 90s or 80s anymore you can't do one experiment and have a paper like <laughs> we all have to do multiple approaches to our so, research question um, so you're you're very right like we're going to have to have multiple approaches so you could do multiple staining you could do IHC and IF. You could do H and E to confirm that there is necrosis in that area or something, and then there you have three image types. But again, that sort of confirms that sort of limitation of histology that you have one section you're showing. If we showed all of the sections that we're quantifying, maybe that would help alleviate some of that concern from reviewers. But images, every figure costs money, <laughs> so most people want to pick the best image. So that's, yeah, it, lots of stuff that we need to consider. <laughs> I'm not going to take your stage anymore, but uh, I just want to okay. say that it was it was wonderful. It was exactly oh, what we you. needed in this kind of uh, seminars. And I congratulate as well, Cherry, for the organization. But it was absolutely Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So is there anyone still have a question that wants to ask Dr. Meadows? If not, we'll like end the webinar here. So thank you, Dr. Meadows, again for the webinar on histology. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. So we appreciate your participation and look forward to connecting with all of you again in future bioprotocol webinar. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, bye.